And when, when we introduce a speaker, we normally say nice things about them. What we're trying to do is we're trying to tell the audience it's worth your 20 minutes or 30 minutes or hour, or however long they're going to speak, to listen to this person because they're very distinguished. They're smart people. They've done all this great stuff. They're a good person. You know, we, 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 we try to accentuate the positive when we introduce a speaker. One speaker said, you know, I was sitting there listening to this introduction and I thought I was in the wrong place because they couldn't be talking about me. There must be somebody else that's here to speak. And, and maybe on occasion you have been introduced either to speak or for something else. And somebody says so many nice things about you that you think, wow, I, I can't really, you know, I'm, 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 they built, built me up too big. I can't do this, you know. <clears throat> you know, if you went someplace and let's just say it was a, a public speaking event and, and someone got up and said this sort of stuff about the speaker, what would you think? The things I've just read, the kind of praise that we just get. This is Psalm 148, very famous psalm. In fact, we sing it. We have a song in our songbook that is almost... Praise him, praise him. Exactly, exactly. Uh, let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and so forth and so on. Anyway, well, how would you feel about that? What would you say, Jim? I can't imagine myself being in an auditorium where that would be said about anybody. It's just uh, all encompassing. If you, it's would, would it make you uh, feel uh, so, skeptical, maybe? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about uncomfortable? Let me ask you a question. I, I think some of you may not remember this, but I, I bet a lot of you have seen a, a black and white film, and the, the title of the film is... No, it's not D. It's just called Triumph of the Will. Have you seen this film? Does anybody remember what this is? Let me tell you. When I start telling you about it, you may remember. Triumph of the Will is a black and white film that was made in 1935. It is a Nazi propaganda film made of a huge Nazi party rally in the city of Nuremberg in 1935. There were 700,000 supporters of Adolf Hitler that went to this big, big rally, this Nazi party rally, and there's a huge assembly, and there's uh, flags and beating of the drums and swastikas everywhere, and all of these people are chanting, Heil Hitler. And it's, it's uh, all the, the cinematography techniques, the, the lenses that they use and the use of overhead photography, it was way ahead of its time, and people have recognized this as being a, a great accomplishment as far as making film goes, but also very powerful propaganda. In fact, in fact, when the United States entered the war and our filmmakers started making propaganda films, some of them just, just cut big sections of this film out and showed it to show American people what they were up against, what they were up against. And so some of you have, have you may not remember it, but if you watched it, you would, probably on YouTube, you, you would see, oh yeah, I remember seeing this when I was in fifth grade, they showed us films in school or something like that, history. And so when we, when we, we would say that this kind of praise for a human being is way over the top. That's the expression we would use, over the top. And so this person that is being recognized as being so wonderful, so powerful, so godlike is someone we should really fear to have that kind of power, that kind of ability to deceive people. Unless, unless of course, they happen to be God. Unless, of course, they happen to be Jesus Christ. So we're, we're going we're gonna to revisit this idea of Psalm 148 and massive praise, over-the-top praise in, in a few minutes uh, when we get into Matthew chapter 21. But what I want to do today uh, is, is start near the end of chapter 20, about when we uh, stopped off last week. And, and we have something, that, again, that if you've been there, <clears throat> you might have been a little bit embarrassed uh, about it. If, if you saw this going on, but anyway, we'll get to it in just a minute. What was the picture on last week's handout on the on the back page? 
if you're if you're very probably don't remember last week, but anyway, there was a, a, a color picture on the second page, the back of the handout last week. What was that picture of? Who knows? You remember what it looked like, May? You remember what that picture was? You don't remember. You don't remember. Matthias, do you have that in your hand? Yeah. So what is that picture of? It's not very good print. I, my color cartridge is about out. Like okay, could, could we pass around? Now, I want you to return this to Matthias. This is your reminder. This is what it looked like. What's this picture? You're old enough to know, Jim. What is it? Yeah, <laughs> that's out in the fields. Out in the fields, good, okay. So what are these people doing? In uh, September, October, if you got in your car and drove south from here, down around Calhoun City, Mississippi, you would find the people are harvesting sweet potatoes. And the harvesters, a lot of them are people that come from Mexico and Central America because they're willing to work that hard, will ride in a wagon. See, that's a wagon being pulled behind a tractor. There is a little roof over them, so that's, that's good. But they, they stand, they stand in the wagon, okay? And there's a machine that digs up the sweet potatoes and it's on a conveyor belt and the people that stand in the wagon are sorting the sweet potatoes based on size. So as, as the sweet potatoes come up into the wagon, they continually pull them off and put them into various bins based upon the size of the sweet potatoes. They do this all day long, okay? One thing about sweet potatoes and, and we grow a lot of sweet potatoes in Mississippi. A lot of people don't know this. Some people call them yams. Do you want to talk about sweet potatoes? They're kind of an orange color. You, do you eat sweet potatoes, man? Yeah. You do. That's great. Okay, I was afraid maybe. I know yams. Everybody in Africa eats yams, so this, it's, it's why. But anyway, they, they require a lot of hand labor. In the spring, very early in the spring, they plant the little plants in a bed really close together. Then... You have to take the plant and transplant it into the field where there's space more water they can grow and produce fruit. All of this requires a lot of hand labor, a lot of hand labor. And so we were talking about the parable of the workers in the vineyard last week, and I wanted you to think about what it must be. A lot of us don't know what it must be like to work all day long in the field. This is hard. I remember. What'd you say? I can't remember. You can remember. Let me ask you a very personal question, Jim. Did you ever pick cotton? I have. Now I see, also cotton the difference between all day long. Jim's age and my age is where people can answer that question. You get to be my age if you're less than 70, less than 75. But we can't say we pick cotton. But you get to Jim's age, you pick cotton. Yep. You pick cotton. And it's, it's, uh, it's work. It's real work. So somebody works all day long picking cotton or sorting sweet potatoes or whatever they were doing. And then somebody comes along and works one hour. They get paid the same as you. How do you feel? You don't like it. You don't like it. So Jesus' parable really strikes home last week. Quick review. Okay, so what lesson was Jesus trying to teach with that parable? What lesson was he trying to teach? Thomas, what do you think? You're, you're studying the law. What, what's, what's, the, what's the principle of the parable of the workers in the vineyard? People at the end got paid the same as people that worked all day. What's the story there? What's the deal? That, uh, God's grace is going to be just as applicable to the person that comes to last minute as the person that has been there all along, rewards going to be the same. Well, you know that that yeah, God's grace is a big point, and and the, what you just said, you know, uh, for years I, I was told that somebody that responds to the gospel when they're very old in life, and somebody that responds as a very young person, they both get the same grace. But but I'd like to say it's 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 more than just timing. That God's grace is based upon our need. It's based upon our need for salvation. It's it's ridiculously generous, and therefore. <clears throat> We are way off base when we seek superiority in the kingdom. Paul, Peter said, well, what's it going to be for us? We've left everything to follow you. He said, don't worry. There are going to be 12 thrones, and you're going to be judging the 12 tribes. You're going to get plenty. And anybody that's left things for my sake, anybody that leaves their father or mother, their possessions, their profession, they're going to get 100 times as much. 
He says, don't, don't worry about it. But then he goes on to tell about this story about, but don't try to get ahead either. You know, there's going to be plenty of blessings for everybody. Well, right after Jesus makes this big deal about don't worry about getting ahead, then two of his disciples, <clears throat> James and John, get their mother to come to Jesus and bow down in front of him, okay? So their mother and, and their father is a guy named Zebedee. Now, by this time, maybe Zebedee is, is dead. But some people think that there's reason to believe that their mother was related to maybe a sister of Mary who is Jesus' mother. And so maybe this is Jesus' aunt. Now, can you imagine this? Your mother's sister comes and bows down to you and says, would you do something for me? What are you going to say? But guys, what are you going to say? Yeah, what you want, yeah. Are you going to say, get out of here? I don't, I don't have time. No, no, I just say, like, it's okay. You think about it. Yeah, you're going to be sweet to her. So what does she want? Well, she says, well, she says, Jesus, uh, what I want, so, so Jesus already told them, look, there's going to be, you know, all these thrones, and, and you're going to have, you know, if you sit on the throne, you got a crown, right? So let's multiply this by six. I'm not going to do 12 of them. I really, I really should do that, but it's going to take up too much time, and my drawing is not very good. But just, just imagine, th these are thrones, by the way. These are people sitting on thrones. <laughs> I have to tell you what that is. Okay, so imagine there are 12 thrones. Then, here's, uh, up here is, is God, you know, Jesus, and the Father. We have to draw an organization chart, and we have to do this. This is, this is hum human nature. So here's God up here, and here's all these, these thrones down here, uh, and, and then everybody else is down here, okay? But hey, if there are 12 of these, could maybe we, we need to have somebody that's you know kind of over the 12, between Jesus and the 12, you know? We, we need to kind of promote a couple of these guys up here, don't you think? I mean, 12 is too, is too in, in management we say span of authority. And if you have 12 people reporting to you, that's a pretty broad span of authority. It's hard to keep up. Everybody comes in and wants to talk to you five minutes, there's an hour, boom, just like that. So you need to have, you know, you need to delegate things a little bit. So she said, hey, would you, would you take these two sons of mine, and I don't care which one, you put one on the right and one on the left when you come into your kingdom, because you're headed for Jerusalem. I can see what's about to happen, why does she do this? Why does she do this? We just got through the parable of the workers in the vineyard, right? We just now got through that. How frustrating this must be to Jesus. He tries to make this point. And then these two guys, they think, well, you know, if we go ask Jesus ourselves, it won't look right. But our mother, our mother, our sweet little old mother who happens to be Lady to Jesus, if she asked him, how can he say no, right? So what, in fact, does he say? What, in fact, does he say? Verse, uh, you do not know what you're asking for. Yeah. Are you able to drink the cup? Okay, now, let's, let's look here. Uh, Jim is reading from chapter 20 and verse 21 and 22, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? What does this refer to? Ming, what is this cup? I think it's a, a, a suffering. Exactly. And in fact, we know in, in chapter 26, a few chapters from here, Jesus is going to be praying in the garden, Father, let this cup pass from me. We would almost say, can you take the chemotherapy I'm going to take? You know, it's the medicine. Can you drink the medicine I'm going to drink? He says, and they say, we can, they answer. No elaboration. Yeah, we can do that. And then Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my cup. But sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. <laughs> okay, so uh, did they? What happened to these two guys? Did they drink the cup? What happens to these guys? 
Bethesda, you know what happens. Can we go and decide on eventually some part that is bad news? Persecuted. What about James? What happens to James? James died. He is killed. Yeah. Does anybody remember what the particulars are about this? Why stone? She says stone. No, if we look at Acts 12, 2, we see that James is beheaded. He is the first of the 12 apostles. He is the first one to be killed, to be martyred. John, we're not so sure about. When we get to the book of Revelation, John is all alone. He is living in exile on the island of Patmos. And tradition varies about what eventually happened to him, but he apparently lived longer than any of the other 12. So here's the first one, here's the last one, and uh, plenty, of, uh, plenty of suffering, plenty of cup uh, to go around with, with those guys. So uh, <clears throat> again, it's just like the parable of the workers in the vineyard. We don't want anybody to get ahead of us in line, okay? So when the 10 heard about this little power play, it, the word that they use here in verse 24 is they were indignant. Okay, it's a pretty strong word. They were really hacked off. Now, what do you mean going around this behind us? We trusted you, and you're trying to do this, and you're trying to get it. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And then verse 28. This is kind of a golden text of Christianity, in, in, in my opinion. Not the golden text, but a golden text of Christianity. Uh, Alyssa, would you read verse 28 for us? Yes. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, not to be not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Same thing in Mark 10, 45, parallel passage in Mark. And so I describe it here on your sheet uh, as the mission statement. Now, we don't do this so much anymore. But there was a time, I'm going to say 10, 15 years ago, of course, I, maybe it was longer than that, I don't remember things perfectly, but where everything had to have a mission statement. If you were in, a, in an organization, for example, your department at the university, your company, or whatever, you had to have a mission statement. Our congregation had to have a mission statement. And for a long time, our mission statement was following Jesus every day. Then we decided to update that, and so we came up with something that was to build trusting relationships to do something or another. I don't know. In my opinion, it was dead on arrival. It was just too complicated for me to remember. Trusting relationships to do something or another. It was, uh, it was the same time that we started FaceTime, and uh, you know, it had a lot of great ideas behind it, but it was a little bit like an elephant. You know what an elephant is? A horse assembled by committee. That's an elephant. So, so the, now, it's going to sound like I'm, I'm carping and complaining and a curmudgeon, because I am a curmudgeon, okay? But anyway, that's, uh, that's beside the point I'm making here. The point here is, if, if, if it's just you and the mirror, okay, you're not in this Bible class, you're not at church, it's just you and your mirror in the bathroom, and you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, what is my mission statement? Really, really, not some high standard. Is it, what is it really? Am, am I here to be served or to serve? To be served or to serve? And then Jesus says, to give my life as a ransom for many. Now this gives us a little bit of theological difficulty, ransom. And the Greek word doesn't mean anything to me or you. Why am I putting this up in a neutron? I'm not sure, but... Anyway, it means the, the price that's paid for a slave to win his freedom, the Lutron, to give his life as a ransom for many. 
In what sense was Jesus' death a ransom? In what sense was his death a ransom? You know, normally when they got ransom, we think about taking somebody hostage and we kidnap them. And then we say, Thomas, if you want to see your wife again, we need $1 million and $1 bills, you know. Put it in a brown paper bag and leave it on the square at midnight, you know. Then you'll get your wife back. Other than that, she's going to, you know. And uh, you're going to say, could I put it on a credit card? <laughs> so, I don't know. But anyway, that's what's going to happen, a ransom. In what sense was Jesus' death a ransom? Christ God and his son Moses were willing to pay to reach the world, to bring those who would to God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus bought us back mm -hmm. from sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that's what that's what he that's what he paid. He laid his life. He paid for us. Mm -hmm. Butch, you're coming for your help. Yes, sir, I got it. Okay. We're good. Uh, yeah, so the, the problem we run, runs into is, is who was the ransom paid to? And if we do that, we're taking the analogy and warping it too far. There, there really wasn't a, a, an entity like the devil or God that had to receive the, the ransom to, to let us go free. But there was a, an objective reality that, that Jim just mentioned, and that is, that is sin. And, and our sin created, in, in some way, a debt. That there is a, uh, if you will, a system of justice in the universe. And so, you know, God cannot tolerate any sin. And for us to be in harmony with him, for us to escape inevitable punishment for our sin, some, something had to be done. And so Jesus' death was, was what was done. Now, if we think about uh, Jesus' life, uh, I'd, I'd like to think about other places where we have a, a mission statement. We, it's not listed here. There are four places that are listed here, and so we'll, we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, but at the very beginning of the book of Matthew, you know, there's this crisis, a marriage problem, and this guy's engaged, Joseph, to a young lady, Mary, and she's pregnant. And he didn't get her pregnant. Whoa, what's going to happen? So an angel appears uh, to Joseph in a dream and says, don't be afraid. The, what's conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. She is going to give birth to a... Well, it's, there's two things that you could say. It's either a son or a daughter. So she's going to give birth to a what? A son. A son. And you are to give him the name. Emmanuel. No, that's, it's a little, that, the manual is introduced in the same passage. Not in this exact verse. This is like chapter 118. You're to give him the name Jesus. Jesus because Jesus means Savior or Deliverer. He will save his people from their sins. Okay, so this is a mission statement save people from their sins that, that, that is introduced in the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. But let's look at some other places here. Uh, sing song, if you would read uh, Mark 138 in just a minute, that's A on your sheet, and uh, Alyssa Luke 1910, and Thomas John 317, and then uh, Jim John 638. Okay, and so let's take a look at these mission statements. <laughs> We've got a mission statement, not to be served, but to serve and to give life ransom for many. And that's one mission statement. Uh, Mark 138. Okay, sing song. Uh, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere, uh, somewhere else to the nearby village so I can preach there also. Uh, that is why I have come. Okay, Alyssa. Okay, Thomas? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Mm. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, is there some way for us to, to generalize these things? They, they're not all the same, okay? These are different uh, short statements of, of Jesus' mission. 
uh, what, what are some things that you would include if we had to have a global mission statement for Jesus? What would you say is involved here? And to give himself to the world. Okay, so this, this seems to be pretty central in a lot of the, of the statements. And, and that's, here's your theology class for today. This is old stuff for Jim, but everybody else hold on to your hats here. And it's, it's uh, I, I may have misspelled it, I don't know. But this is the study of what it takes to, to overcome these problems. It's, it's the idea of, of salvation. And so a big part, not all the statements, but a big part of all the statements is, is to save people from their sins. Salvation. Okay. Salvation. Anything else you see here? There's a couple other big, big trunks here in, in these mission statements. What else would you say this year besides his, his atoning mission? Do the will of the Father. Okay, do the will of the Father. Whatever that happens to be, do the will of the Father. All right? Then another one. There's another big idea here. To preach. Okay, so, so there's the idea of a message. A message that is very uh, prominent here, the idea of a message. And then going back to the one we've been focusing on, uh, Matthew 20, 28, there's the idea of, of servanthood, of, of, of service. So th these are all parts of this uh, mission for, for Jesus. Now, somebody's made the point that if the church is the body of Christ, then you and I need to have uh, you and I need to have our lives informed by these these missions also. That this needs to be a big part of our reason for being, our reason for being. Uh, you know, a, a purpose outside ourselves. <clears throat> I, th I think, you know, there's so many good things that Christians can be involved in, the church can be involved in, that's, that sometimes it's, it's easy for us to get off on a, a tangent and, and get away from, from some of these things. And so I, I think it's good for time to time for us to re-examine, you know, our, our, our focus and, and what, we are, what we have, as Jesus put it, come for. For I did not come to be served, but to serve. So think again about James and John. Now James and John, I mean, these are great people, okay? They're way, way above me. But we, we meet them in the gospels and they are so hot, they're fishermen, okay? These, these guys are, you know, they work with their hands. They're tough guys. And, and they are so full of anger, Jesus calls them the Boanerges. At one point, they want to kill everybody in a Samaritan village. Shall we call down fire from heaven? Napalm the place, okay? Men, women, and children. They don't want to let us stay here overnight? We'll torch it. You know? These guys are tough guys, okay? But, uh, of course, John is the, becomes the uh, apostle of love or whatever. Uh, but anyway, they, they're trying to get ahead, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. If you want to follow me, it's all about being the slave of all. Being the slave of all. Really a great corrective there. Okay, so now we come to the triumph of will. Uh, to, we come to triumph of the will, the thing that I introduced at the beginning. And, and that will be in, in, uh, in chapter 21. I'm going to jump over two blind men receive their sight. The only important thing for you to notice there, as far as today's lesson goes, is what they call Jesus. In the end of uh, verse 30, they call him Son of David. Son of David. Now we've run into that a couple places in the book of Matthew. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says this is going to be a story about the son of David. There's another place where somebody's appealing to him, the Canaanite woman that wants him to heal her little daughter. She calls him son of David. If you call somebody son of David, that means they're royal. Okay, so that's where we're headed as we move on into Jerusalem, last week of Jesus' life. As they approach Jerusalem, 
and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. The other Gospels talk about just one animal. Matthew puts in two. This is common in Matthew. Lots of times, like there are two blind men, two demoniacs. He, he, lots of times he puts in two where the other Gospels just have one. I, I don't think there's a direct conflict here. Of course, you can only ride one. You can only ride one. And, and some of the translations are a little awkward on that point, but it's, it's pretty, pretty obvious that he only wrote one. Uh, <clears throat> this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Now, we've had this fulfilled prophecy thing throughout the book of Matthew. Matthew keeps pointing back to Old Testament. He is the most Jewish of all the gospel writers because he emphasizes the ties to the Old Testament. But this prophecy, Zechariah 9, 9, is an explosive, okay? Because we're not just going into Nazareth or Capernaum or someplace like that. Jericho, we're going into Jerusalem, okay? That's like going into Beijing. That's going into Washington, D.C. That's going into Seoul. That's going into Tokyo. That's, you're, you're headed for the seat of power, okay? And so when they say this took place, say to daughter Zion, that means the people of Jerusalem, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Okay, so what about Jesus' choice of transportation here? Now, here's a guy, remember, he's walked all over you know, Israel. He's walked miles and miles. It's it's like, you know, walking to Tupelo and back, walking to Batesville and back, walking, you know, maybe maybe almost to Memphis. He's walked a lot. But now he gets really close into Jerusalem and he's going to ride. And he's going to ride a donkey? What's the story here? What's going on? What is What does this symbolize? What is it communicating when somebody comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey? You know, we would say, well, it means he's a Democrat, right? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But what, what is, what, Sing Song, why is he riding this donkey? Uh, to fulfill the Old Testament scripture, uh, saying that, uh, that, that the Messiah will ride a donkey. Okay, so, so this is exactly right. It, it directly fulfills this prophecy about the king riding a donkey into Jerusalem. Uh, but why does, the, why does Zechariah says, it, there's an important word here, it says this uh, king that's coming, you ought to be really happy because this king is coming in and he is gentle and riding on a donkey. What other things might Jesus have ridden besides a donkey? Alyssa, what, what other things? What did you say? A stallion. A stallion, a horse. Or he could ride a camel, I guess. But You see, the horse was a military vehicle. A general rides a horse. Armies have horses. Horses are, are for military use, okay? They are expensive, and they mean business, and Romans ride horses, okay? Because that's how you fight wars. The ESV translation, instead of saying donkey in verse 5, says a beast of burden. How about that? And that sort of communicates what you're driving at, I think. Mm -hmm. So this this is not a uh, this is not the kind of animal that a conquering warlike leader would ride. This is a, a peaceful leader, a peaceful leader, and so that that's uh, communicating to people that Jesus not only fulfills the Old Testament prophecy, as Sing Song pointed out, but he is definitely a peaceful leader. And to be peaceful, a prophet, priest, judge, you have to be powerful. You don't worry about you know taking control because frankly you are in control. So that's a, that's a, a major point. So look at the question eleven. I think maybe on the back page of your sheet. And uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read to you what happens next, and I want you to quickly tell me your reaction. Uh, Jim, you are a child. Uh, May Wong, you are a Roman soldier. Ming, you are one of the twelve followers, 12 disciples. Uh, 
sing song, you are a beggar, sorry. And that means that uh, you, listen, you get to be a martyr, okay? And you're a Pharisee, Thomas. And, and then that leads you to be one of the Sanhedrin or chief priests, Jim, okay? Did I give you a sign already? No. Yeah, you gave me a sign of me and a okay. child. Okay, okay. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a, a Sanhedrin chief priest. So I want you to tell me what you're thinking when you see this. Okay, this is what happens. <clears throat> uh, starting in, in verse uh, 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now we're getting into Psalm 148. We're getting into triumph of the will stuff. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Okay, so let's hear from a child. What do you think? What do you think? Oh, Mama, it's like a celebration. Yeah, it's a parade. This is, this is wonderful. Maybe school's out today. <laughs> Ming, what do you think? Uh, you're a Roman soldier. What are you thinking? May. I'm sorry, May Wong. <laughs> you are, a, I, I'm sorry, I'm, May. So you're a Roman soldier. What are you thinking when you see this? Uh, he's the king of Judah. Well, is that good news or bad news for you? Uh, that makes you think he's not uh, Give me a lot to look like the, the great army. Yeah, he doesn't look like an army, but these people are willing to fight for him, and they're going to fight against you. You're not happy, okay? You're feeling frightened and threatened. See, there are not many Roman soldiers. They're tough guys, but there's thousands of Jews. There's just a few hundred Roman soldiers, okay? Jim. What am I? I, I thought I was the child, but I'm the other child. You're one of the twelve. One of the twelve. Uh, I think I would be confused. Jesus has said already, just previously, mm -hmm. that he's going to be uh, persecuted, turned over to the Gentiles, crucified, all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. That has some sword. Uh, no, everybody loves him. Yeah. Everybody loves him. Yeah, what's going on? So. Me, me, you are a. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Did I did I say? I, I think you. Okay, you you re, you respond to the one that I gave you. Then, okay, did I give you one? Yeah, wow, that's all. Okay, and so what do you think? Uh, I'm called. You you, you want, like him? Like yeah. him. What? If, one thing I was thinking, I might, if I were one of the twelve, I might say, at last, everybody else gets it now, just like we have. It's happening. Okay, sing song. Uh, what about you? You're a beggar. I keep I think joyful like. Because she's going to bring uh, hope. Yeah, maybe I'll get a job or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alyssa, what are you thinking? Um, I guess I'm thinking like, well, I guess maybe hopeful. <clears throat> I'm not sure. Yeah, or will this cause trouble? You know. Yeah. Thomas, uh, you are a Pharisee. What are you thinking? This guy's a the prophecy. Yeah. Trying, you know, make These people are fools. Yeah. Th this guy's a, he's a shyster. He's, he's a crook. Yeah. And, uh, that's you. What'd you say? You're next. I'm next. I'm one of the Sanhedrin and my reaction is actually recorded in, in the book of John. And it's the whole world that's gone after this guy. What are we, we're not doing any good. We're going to have to tighten up here. Something's got to be done here. Okay, I've kept you over time. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, participation this morning. So.